It's a great pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker, Professor Follan. He just until moments ago did not know about my existence, but I knew about <laughs> his existence <laughs> not true. ever since you were allowed to enter the English language part of our library in Wrocław. <laughs> and I found out about his fantastic works and books. Without further ado, Professor Follen. Thank you. It's a <laughs> it's a pleasure and an honor to be here to give this talk. So uh, this has been a largely applied oriented meeting. I'm going to start out in applied territory and then very quickly move over to what is usually considered rather abstruse pure mathematics. But it's going to be of a sort where you can see pretty concretely what's going on, which is why I think it's nice. So we start out looking at time frequency translations on the real line, or frequency and or translations and modulations, if you prefer. Uh, I presume for this audience I don't have to sell that idea as something that's useful and important. Okay, these, these operators, translations and modulators, modulations almost commute with each other, but not quite. If you put them in the opposite order, you get a scalar factor. So if you incorporate products, let's say you start by translating, then you modulate, and then throw in a scalar of modulus one, you get a group. And if you just, uh, it's, it's, it's the real Heisenberg group, and if you just abstract out the group law, you take the x, y, and z as coordinates, then here's, here's what the group law looks like. Okay, but I want to look not at all real translations and modulations, but just a discrete set of them. So consider the subgroup generated by a the integer multiples of one particular translation and the integer multiples of one particular modulation. So again, what you'll get is something that looks like that. And again, for this audience, this is bread and butter. This is the where you start for the theory of Gabor frames, for example. So this is uh, something common knowledge. So let me, by rescaling the t-axis, I can always take one of these two numbers, tau and omega, to be one, and I'll take tau to be one. Omega still has to stay arbitrary. So then what you've got here, it's, it's a unitary representation of the so-called discrete Heisenberg group, which it's just like the real Heisenberg group, except that the coordinates have to be integers. Okay, and the representation in question, it's down here. It's uh, parameterized by the number omega. And so the, the first variable, j, does the translation. The k does the modulation. And the l is that extra scalar factor that you have to throw in to get a group. So plenty of people have studied this kind of this this thing a lot but if you're interested in the representation theoretic side of harmonic analysis you've got a unitary representation of a group here and the next question that occurs to you is how does this representation decompose into irreducible representations now i'm going to spend the next couple of slides sort of unpacking that question a little bit for you uh, it's not quite as straightforward as it might be. So it's just so we are all on the same page for terminology, let me remind you a, a unitary representation, and I won't be talking about anything but unitary representations, of a locally compact group G is a continuous homomorphism from G into the unitary group of some Hilbert space, continuous with respect to the strong operator topology on the unitary group. You say it's irreducible if there are no non-trivial closed subspaces of the Hilbert space that are invariant under all the operators. And I'll point out that since it's a unitary representation, if you have an invariant subspace, then its orthogonal complement is also invariant, so you get a direct sum decomposition. 
You say that two representations are equivalent, and again, unitarily, if there is a unitary map from one Hilbert space to the other Hilbert space that intertwines the two, uh, like so. And we'll look at the set of equivalence classes of irreducible representations of G. It's denoted by G hat, and it's called the dual object or dual space of G. Now, if, if G is a compact group, then every, every unitary representation is a direct sum of irreducible representations. And in that case, if you have a representation, you decompose it into irreducibles, you can say exactly which equivalence classes of irreducibles occur, and each one occurs with a certain definite multiplicity. You know, you have one copy of this guy, and you have four copies of this guy, maybe infinitely many copies of something else. So that's the way, it, that's the, way the structure of representation theory goes. But if G is non-compact, then uh, you have continuous families of irreducible representations, and so you have to go from direct sums to direct integrals. Now, direct integrals maybe sound, sound a little bit scary at first. They're, they're really not, so let me just briefly tell you how you do that. So suppose you have a family of representations of G uh, parametrized by a measure space A. And pi alpha acts, it, they, they can act on different Hilbert spaces. Then the direct, you have to form the direct integral of these Hilbert spaces. And essentially what that is, it's the set of all functions from the parameter space into the union of the Hilbert spaces so that the value of f at alpha lies, lies in the alpha of Hilbert space. And then they should uh, be square integrable over the measure mu. Now, there's some measurability issues you have to worry about here. I mean, if, if, if each, if the value of f of alpha is in a different Hilbert space for every alpha, then what the hell do you mean by measurable? Uh, this is not a difficult problem to fix. You do have to address it, but I'm not going to do that here. If they're all the same Hilbert space, then no problem. It's just a set of all, it's, it's the, the space of square integrable functions from A into that fixed Hilbert space. And then the direct integral of the representations is just the representation you get by acting pointwise. Okay, pi of gf at alpha is the alpha th representation of g acting on the value of f at alpha. So uh, let's have a simple example, something that's again familiar to everybody here. If you take the real g to be the real line, the irreducible representations are all one dimensional, and so they're you know one by one unitary matrices, which are complex numbers of modulus one. So, oops, stop, there. Uh, there they are, parametrized by C. And if you take the direct integral of all those guys with respect to Lebesgue measure on the line, then you're, this, this acts on L2 of the real line, just scalar valued functions, by multiplying by the the character. And then if you, you conjugate that by the Fourier transform, of course, that be, this, is, this is all modulations. It becomes translations. And so this tells you, say, if I, if I say that the, you take the regular representation of the real line on itself by translations, and I say the direct integral, the, the decomposition of that into irreducibles is this. Okay, what I mean is that the, the, the translation representation is unitarily equivalent by the Fourier transform to this thing which is explicitly a direct integral. So, back to the general picture, what you'd like to have happen is the following. First, that the set of equivalence classes of irreducible representations is a geometrically reasonable object you have to be a little bit flexible about what you mean by reasonable. I won't go into detail here, but it's something that doesn't look too horrible. Uh, it, equipped with a natural sigma algebra, what you can call Borel sets. And also you should be able to choose a representative from each equivalence class 
in a, again, a reasonable way so that you can do measure theory and integration over things. And then the theorem that says that every, uh, every rep unitary representation is a direct sum of irreducibles or direct integral of irreducibles in a canonical way, what you have is that the, the, your given representation here is it's a direct integral. Well, you, you break up the space of irreducibles into various pieces and this piece occurs with multiplicity one and then here's the piece that occurs with multiplicity two, these numbers outside of the multiplicities. And finally, this one occurs with multiplicity infinity. And this is unique, as unique as it possibly can be. Uh, the measure mu is determined. You can, you can replace mu by any other measure that has the same sets of measure zero. In other words, they're mutually absolutely continuous. So you know what sets of measure zero mean. And then these sets of multiplicity are determined up to sets of mu measure zero. So since you've got some measure theory, that's, that's as unique as you're ever going to get. That's what ought to happen. Sometimes it does. But there are two kinds of groups. There are good groups and there are bad groups. Okay, the, the good groups, the official name is type one, for reasons I won't go into. Uh, this works the way I, ju I just described it. And then for bad groups, it all goes to hell. Okay, G hat is a horrible object. And yeah, you can still decompose representations in direct, direct integrals, but you usually can't take G hat as the parameter space. And there's usually no new uniqueness. Well, what's the, what does this dichotomy between two kinds of groups look like for, for examples? Uh, type 1 groups, well, abelian groups and compact groups are fine. Among the connected Lie groups, the ones that are close to being abelian, that is nilpotent, or far from being abelian, semi-simple, or algebraic, those are okay. The ones that are in the middle, solvable groups, some are good, some aren't. And for discrete groups, the only ones that are good, the only ones that are type 1, are the ones that are almost abelian in the sense that they have an abelian normal subgroup with finite index, finite quotient space. And the discrete Heisenberg group is not one of those. The discrete Heisenberg group is a bad group. Okay, so we're coming back to our special case now. We're looking at the discrete Heisenberg group and we're looking at this uh, representation by translations and modulations. And let's see what we can say about it. Okay, I need to make a couple of preliminary remarks. The center of this group is simply the things of the form 0, 0, L. And it, it, acts, um, it acts by scalars in this representation. Now, it's a theorem, Schur's lemma, that the center always has to act by scalars in any irreducible representation. And if you want to decompose our rho omega here, only those rep irreducible representations which act the same way on the center are going to occur. So that simplifies our task a little bit. We just have to look at representations with one given central character, as it's called. It's a one-dimensional representation of the center. Now, this breaks up into two cases. Either our fundamental frequency omega is rational or not. So for the rational case, let's say omega is p over q, this in, in lowest terms. And here the central character is trivial on the multiples of 0, 0, Q. And so it factors through this group that I call HQ. Uh, 
where you replace the last variable, an integer, by an integer mod q. And it's the same group law with mod q arithmetic in the last factor. And now this is a good group. I've killed off most of the, the, this is not only the center, but also the commutator subgroup, and I've killed most of it. So what's left does have an abelian normal subgroup of finite index. In fact, you can take the set of all JKL, where J, the first one, is divisible by Q. Okay, that has index Q, it's abelian normal. And to show you how this works, let me take the simplest subcase here, which is where omega is actually an integer. Q is 1. So in that case, uh, H mod H1 is just Z cross Z cross the trivial group uh, with the standard abelian group structure. Its irreducible representations, again, are the familiar Fourier characters. And I claim that in this case, our representation rho omega, omega is here p, an integer p. It's you take the direct integral of all the characters over the, the whole character space, and then take a direct sum of p copies of that. And the way this works is, again, something that I presume most of you are familiar with, our old friend, the Zach transform. For a long time, I persisted in calling that the Weber-Bresen transform, and I still think that's a good name for it, but it's clear that the battle is over and Zach has won. Mm -hmm. So uh, here it is. It's a map from functions of one variable to functions of two variables, uh, given by this funny-looking Fourier series. And it's... Uh, it's periodic in the first variable, because it's visibly a Fourier series in U, and it has this quasi-periodicity function property in V. So you, you translate V by an integer, you get this factor of absolute value 1 coming out. So at least the absolute value of, of, a, of a Zach transform is periodic in both variables. So if you're going to look at L2, uh, you want to just look at it on the unit square. And then it's a simple little calculation. You, you just use the Parseval formula for that Fourier series to see that this is a, uh, a, an isometry. And it's actually, and it's also easy to check that it's onto. So that's a unitary map from L2 of R into L2 of the unit square. But you think of the functions not just living on the unit square, but on the whole complex R2 this way. And you then see what happens when you first apply the representation rho and then the Zach transform. And so what do you do here? Let's see, that's, uh, there we go. Well, you change, the, you make a change of variable in the summation. You replace n by n minus j. Uh, so j u, the, uh, PKV changing, changing V, um, replacing n, by n, n plus j doesn't do anything there. What you end up with is, is a character parameterized by u and PV times ZF, and that says exactly that what you've got here is the direct integral all, over all those characters, the integral over 0, 1 squared of chi sub minus u PV du dp, but chi sub uv is periodic in u and v of period 1, so u and minus u doesn't matter. And pv, well that's the same as just taking v from 0 to p, and because of the periodicity again, that's the same as taking it from 0 to 1 and then taking a direct sum of p copies. So there it is. Nice. And for the rational case with non-trivial denominator, uh, it's similar but a little more complicated. In that case, uh, there is a nice general technique it's called the Mackey machine for producing a complete list of irreducible representations of this group with, with the given central character. Uh, it's parameterized in this case, again, by a two-dimensional torus, but now the natural thing is uh, to take it to be R mod 1 over Q times integers. Um, 
here's what it is. The Hilbert space is the set of all functions from the integers to the complex numbers that have, again, a quasi-periodicity property. So if you know f of 1 up to f of m, then you know everything by this. So it's a really a copy of complex Q space. And here's what the representation does. Again, the x should be a j here, sorry. The first variable acts by translations, the second by modulations, twisted by this beta a little bit, and the last one by scalars. And then it's a nice non-trivial exercise to see that if you take the direct integral of all those things uh, with multiplicity p, then you get, again, the representation that we started with. So that's fine. Now, what happens in the irrational case? Well, first of all, now I don't have this simple version of the Mackey machine to tell me what all the irreducible representations look like. So I've got to come up with a supply of irreducible representations to work with. And again, the, all, all I care about is irreducible representations with this given central character. So let me tell you a way of constructing a bunch of them. It's, this is uh, a little bit technical. Please bear with me for a bit. So you start off by looking at the operation of translation by omega on r mod z. Well, if you think of r mod z as the circle, then it's, it's rotation by the angle 2 pi omega, rotation by an irrational angle. Irrational meaning irrational multiple of 2 pi. Okay, so that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is a measure on the circle. And if you have this measure, then you can take it and compose it with this irrational rotation. You can irrational rotate uh, any number of times. You get a sequence of measures. And you say that mu is quasi-invariant if these are all equivalent. Mutually absolutely continuous, have the same sets of measures zero. And you say that the measure is ergodic if the only S-invariant sets either have measure zero or their complements have measure zero. So they're almost nothing or almost everything. So if you're given such a measure, an ergodic, quasi-invariant, and sigma-finite measure on the circle, then I'm going to define a representation of the group on L2 of that measure by as follows. Phi mu of JKL, F of T is, well, um, again, it's, it's the same basic idea. The J acts by translations, but in this case, translations by multiples of omega. Uh, the K acts by modulations, and now the omega has moved over to the J instead of K. Uh, L does what it always does, and then because it's only, mu is only supposed to be quasi-invariant instead of fully invariant, you have to throw in the, the square root of the radon nicodem derivative to keep it unitary. Then you can show that these things are irreducible. The irreducibility is equivalent to the ergodicity of mu. And moreover, there, the two of these are equivalent if and only if the measures are equivalent. Uh, again, it's easy to see that if you have two measures that satisfy these conditions, either they are equivalent or else they are mutually singular. Because otherwise you get in trouble with the ergodic condition. So there's, there's a bunch of irreducible representations. Well, at least if I know how to construct these measures. So what are some examples? Well, counting measure on any orbit, that's a simple one. Lebesgue measure on the, the whole circle, that's another obvious one. But that's not all. There are lots of other ones. Uh, I know of at least three papers by three different people giving three completely different constructions of uncountable families of mutually singular <laughs> quasi-invariant ergodic measures on the circle. There are tons of them. And it, it, I think it's 
basically hopeless to try to write down a list of all of them. And moreover, even if, you can, even if you've got all the measures there, you still don't have all the representations. Because the ones I've shown you are the ones that come from the trivial co-cycles. And there are these gadgets called co-cycles. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, but there's, there's certain functions satisfying certain functional equations. And if you take the definition of the representation that I wrote down on the previous slide, and you can throw in a co-cycle into that formula, and you get something new. So here's, an, here's at least part of what I was saying before. The, the, the G hat here is, is horrible. But we don't need all of these things. We're, we're, we're interested in decomposing this one particular representation by translations and modulations. So let's see if we can at least do that much. So let's, let's go back to this, one of the simpler versions here, where mu is the counting measure on an orbit. Okay, now an orbit of this irrational rotation, right, it's a dense subset of the, the circle. You, you keep applying the rotation and you never quite get back to where you started from, but you fill up a dense subset. Okay, let me instead think of the orbit as, as, uh, as the integers. Okay, so let's identify, you start out with beta and then you take the orbit of beta by adding multiples of omega and let's just identify that with the integer m. And if you take the representation that I described for you and move it over to the integers this way, then uh, you get this. Again, j is translations, k is modulations, and l is these scalars. And now let's form the direct integral beta going from zero up to omega of these guys. That acts on L2 of the interval zero omega cross the integers. In effect, I mean, it's, it's L2 of zero omega with values in L2 of the integers, but you can think of that as L2 of the product space. And, it, okay, there again is the, the formula, but now zero omega cross integers. Think of that as, as a bunch of copies of the interval zero omega indexed by the integers. So you take the, the first one, zero omega, and then you put the, 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 fir, the, the number one one next to it, omega to two omega, then the second one goes from two omega to three omega, and also off to the left, and you fill out the real line. And so now if you take this representation and move it over to the real line in that procedure, lo and behold, you get back the representation that we were looking at, our original rho sub omega. Great. It's, uh, th th this, this is uh, simpler than you might have expected. We have a direct integral decomposition of our rho omega this way. What's not to like about it? Well, one little problem is that these representations pi beta are not all inequivalent to each other, unlike the previous cases that I showed you. Uh, pi beta depends only on the orbit of beta up to equivalence. And so if you were going to try to rewrite this in a way so that you just have an integral over different equivalent classes and then maybe with multiplicities, what you would need is a cross section for the orbits. A measurable cross section so that you can do integration theory on it. Then there ain't no such thing. Okay, this is basically the classic example of a Lebesgue non-measurable set. Now, the, 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 the example you see in most textbooks, you take the reals mod the rationals, okay, and you take a cross section for the rationals in the reals, you, make, you can make it in the, in the unit interval. And that has to be non-measurable, but the only property of the rationals that you're using there is that they are a countable dense subgroup of the reals. 
Well, here the multiples of omega are a countable dense subgroup of the circle. And so for exactly the same reason, uh, there's no measurable cross sections here. So you cannot separate out the equivalence classes in a measurable way and, and use the uh, h hat as a, as a parameter space to do a nice uh, theory with. And moreover, this is an example, gives an example of non-uniqueness. Now, this is not news. Um, a guy named Kawakami wrote a paper about 30, 31 mm -hmm. years ago where he gave uh, <coughs> several different, well, a, a whole bunch of different irreducible de decompositions of rho omega. But to read that paper, you have to read two of his previous papers, and there are these vast forests of impenetrable notation and various pieces of machinery that he brings in, and it's, it's not easy going. I'm going to show you a different way to get different decompositions of omega, which does more than what Kawakami did, <coughs> And it's also infinitely more transparent. I have uh, 13 minutes to do so, and I think that's going to be more than enough. So let's retreat to the real Heisenberg group <coughs> for a minute and think about automorphisms of the real Heisenberg group that leave the center pointwise fixed. Okay, I want to preserve the central character as usual. Now there are two kinds of automorphisms that do that. There are the inner, auto <coughs> inner automorphisms, and those aren't interesting. They don't give you anything new here. But the other kind are the symplectic automorphisms. Well, that's, that's, I'm using the word that's appropriate if you want to jack this up into n dimensions. Uh, in, in, uh, for, for on R2, the symplectic transformations are just the linear maps of determinant 1, in other words, SL2R. So any uh, 2 by 2 matrix of determinant 1 defines an automorphism of the, of the Heisenberg group. Uh, it just does, it does the obvious thing. It acts by its uh, natural action on R2 in the first two variables. And then the central variable z, well, it does what it has to in order to make it an automorphism. And let me say here that this quadratic mess over there is an artifact of the way I decided to write the group law. If you use exponential coordinates on the Heisenberg group instead, then that stuff isn't there. It looks simpler, but there's, there are prices to be paid for that. So. Anyhow, take my word for it. This, you can check. This is, a, this is an automorphism. <coughs> well, now let's look at, uh, let's ask, what, uh, can, can we get an automorphism of the discrete Heisenberg group of this sort? Well, if you wanted this transformation to map integer coordinates to integer coordinates, well, in the first place, then, it's certainly A, B, C, and D have to be all integers, so you have to be in, a, in SL2Z. And then there's this unfortunate factor of a half here. It's a little bit annoying. Uh, if you want an automorphism of the discrete Heisenberg group, you have to assume that AC is even and BD is even. They can't both be odd because otherwise uh, A, B, C, and D would all be odd and then A, A D minus B, C would be even and it's supposed to be one. But even if A, D, and B, C, uh, if, if one of those two guys is odd, you still get not an automorphism of the discrete group, but an isomorphism from it to a slightly different subgroup. Where, uh, well, there's, there's two possibilities, depending on whether it's A, C, or B, D that's odd. Uh, if it's A, C, for example, if this is the odd guy, then the range of this consists of things whose, well, the first two coordinates are integers, 
The third coordinate is a half integer, call it n, and 2n has to be congruent to x mod 2. So it's, it's, uh, it's an actually an integer of x is even, it's, it's half an odd integer of x is odd. And I represent uh, this family of irreducible representations that I wrote down for you before. It works perfectly well on these other groups too. I mean, it doesn't care whether, here, whether, whether L is an integer or a half integer. So in any case, you can take our irre irreducible representations, pi beta, compose them with this automorphism, phi a, and you get an, uh, uh, an irreducible representation of the discrete Heisenberg group. This works for any a in SL2z. Okay. And now, Again, let me come back to the real Heisenberg group for just a minute. The representation that we're, by tri time frequency translations that we started out with, it's the restriction to the discrete Heisenberg group of a representation of the real Heisenberg group. Okay, same formula as before. But now, as a representation of the real Heisenberg group, it's irreducible. That's well known, not hard to check. And now if you compose that with the automorphism phi a, you get another such representation with the same central character because that automorphism preserves the center pointwise. But the Stone von Neumann theorem, one way of saying it, is that there's only, only one irreducible representation of the Heisenberg group with a given non-trivial central character up to, up to uh, equivalence. And uh, the intertwining operators comes from the so-called metaplectic representation of the symplectic group here. And so, I, you know, I could write them down for you. Some of them are easier to write down than others, but they're perfectly well known. It's not really relevant to, to know exactly what they look like here. So given any A in SL2Z, You start out with rho omega, that's equivalent to rho omega composed with phi a, and now you take it, the, the decomposition we had before, you compose that with phi a. And so you have this new direct integral decomposition where the ingredients are the pi beta circle phi a. Okay, for each a and L sl 2 z you get a decomposition of this sort. And now the question is, how different are they? Okay, suppose you have two matrices in SL2Z. If the first row of the one matrix is not equal to the first row of the other matrix up to a factor of plus or minus one, then none of the representations that go into one decomposition is equivalent to any of the representations that go into the other one. They are completely disjoint. Now, why does that happen? Well, remember that the pi beta composed with phi a, it, it acts on little l2, l2 of the integers. And here's the formula for it. Uh, never mind all this, these messy exponential things for the moment. Let's focus on the last bit. F of m plus aj plus bk. So if aj plus bk happens to be zero, then you're not moving, you're not shifting f over at all. It just stays there and gets multiplied by these exponential guys. So this operator has discrete spectrum. The, you know, the, the canonical basis for little l2, the functions that are one in one slot and zero everywhere else, are an eigenbasis, and these exponential things are the eigenvalues. On the other hand, if aj plus bk is not zero, then you have a weighted shift operator with weights of absolute value one, and that thing doesn't have any discrete spectrum. 
right? Because if you had an eigenvector for this thing, and you look at, uh, at one, com uh, one place where it's non-zero, then at all the other places that you get by shifting repeatedly, you'd have to have, the, the, it would still have to be non-zero, it would have to have the same amplitude at each of these places, and then it can't be square summable. So this has purely, purely continuous spectrum. And now the point is, of course, that if you have these two different matrices, okay, um, the conditions aj plus bk equals zero and a prime j plus b prime k equals zero are, are mutually incompatible. I mean, except for, for, uh, except for j equals k equals zero. So, that, you know, they, def they define two different lines through the origin. Those two equations define two different lines through the origin. They're different because uh, A and B have to be relatively prime in order for A, B, C, D to have determinant one because, you know, if, if A and B were both divisible by something, then the determinant would be di divisible by that same thing. So, uh, that, that guarantees, that tells you that, that you know what A and B are up to a factor of plus or minus one just from knowing the slope of that line, which is uh, minus A over B. So you have two lines with different slopes. They're different lines. They intersect only at the origin. So these two representations, pi beta composed with phi A and pi any other beta composed with uh, phi A prime, have different spectral properties. Okay, there, one of them is, is discrete spectrum for this set of values of J and K, but for those set of values of J and K, the other one has continuous spectrum. So they're not equivalent. On the other hand, uh, if the two first rows are the same up to a factor of plus or minus one, then it's not hard to write down an intertwining operator for the two, and, the, and in fact they are equivalent. You have to take the same if, if this is a plus sign, then these two signs have to be plus, and if this is minus, then these two guys have to be minus. Uh, and also uh, this here. If it's in, in the minus case, you get from pi beta to pi minus beta, but you're, again, because of periodicity in, in beta, you, uh, you get the same set of representations up to equivalence. So then the last question is, uh, well, given, given an A and a B, relatively prime, well, in that case, the ideal that they generate is everything. So you can certainly find a C and a D so that AD minus BC is equal to one. And so uh, given any A and B, you can, do this construction. And so you have an infinite family of completely inequivalent, irreducible decompositions of rho omega parametrized by pairs of integers. Well, up to plus or minus ones. I forget. And this includes the, the families described by Kawakami. Uh, essentially what he got were the ones where either A is equal to one or B is equal to one. But I get quite a lot more and uh, a lot easier than he did. So uh, there are more things that you can say about the weird phenomena that happen in this situation. Uh, let me just conclude by mentioning one of them. You know, for an abelian group like, like the real line, the, the set of characters, g hat, you can think of that as the maximal ideal space for the group algebra L1 of the group. It's one-to-one it's <coughs> -one correspondence. Now for non-abelian groups then uh, instead of talking about 
maximal ideals, you have to talk about primitive ideals, and then you should replace the group algebra L1 by its completion, the group C star algebra. But anyhow, there's, there's again a correspondence. Every representation defines a primitive algebra in a, a primitive ideal in a certain algebra that's associated with the group. And in the, in, if it's a good group, then this correspondence is one to one. But in this case, Right, I, I showed you this huge family of irreducible representations of H that all have the same central character. And I said there were even more. They, all of them, define the same primitive ideal in the group algebra. So again, vastly different behavior than you might have expected. Thank you. very much for a great talk. Now it's time for questions, comments. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the Abelian case, a lot of interesting things arise from, from uh, considering, for example, max subgroups that are maximal with respect to certain symplectic forms, right? Um, so what, what yeah. happens in the, this, not this more general setting? I mean, does, does, does the symplectic and metaplectic play important roles, or, or are they even analogies? Well, okay, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you were having in mind for, for, for the abelian case. I mean, the metaplectic representation does come in here. Yeah. Uh, because those give you the, the intertwining operators for, for rho and rho composed with the other ones. That may be and this, fun. yeah. Any other question or comment? I do. Yeah. question. So, uh, in the irrational case, the uh, corresponding discrete class of algebra is a one factor. Yes. And we know the Kamitan, right? The Kamitan, it's basically. It's Similar uh, with one by omega. Okay. Yeah. Somehow. Right. That's right. So, if we'd like to find the invariant subspaces for mm. the uh, discrete Heisenberg group, we can look at the projection in the Kamitan. Uh huh. Such yeah. Invariant subspaces. How? I mean, with the class, I mean, knowing the class of projections from the Kamitan would give you. I mean, also create a similar family of. Uh, Good question. I don't. I. I don't know. <coughs> yeah, he's he's pointing out another another thing that I could have added to the list here, that if you take our representation row of the of discrete Heisenberg, and look at the von Neumann algebra it generates, right? You've got a bunch of unitary operators, you take their linear combinations, take the closure in the weak operator topology. That's a von Neumann algebra. It turns out to be a factor of type 2, type 2, 1, in fact. And uh, that's something else that's not going to happen for a good group. There, the, the primary representations are all type 1 von Neumann algebras. That's where the type 1 name comes from, by the way. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, let us thank our colloquial speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. The 2014 February Fourier talks have almost concluded, except for the high tea, I never understood that. There's food and drinks in the language. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I guess that's exactly what